Okay, so um, good evening. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome all of you to this annual lecture of uh, Oxford Development Studies. Um, I'm Nandini Guptu and I'm the chair of the editorial board. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Raka Ray, whom I will introduce in a minute, and also to welcome all of you in the audience. It is truly wonderful to have so many in the audience, even though I can't see anybody, sadly. Um, I would like to take a couple of minutes to say a few words about uh, some recent developments in ODS before introducing the speaker and also Cheryl Doss, uh, to whom I will hand over to chair this session. So as some of you may know, we relaunched ODS in March 2020. As a development studies journal based in the Global North, we felt we needed to take the journal in a new direction in order to reach a wider audience and to ensure the representation of the widest possible range of voices in the production of knowledge and ideas in development studies. To this end, we have restructured uh, our governance and organization. We have abolished our UK-based editorial board and the International Advisory Board. Instead, we have formed a small team of associate editors who are uh, located both in the UK and overseas led by Cheryl as the chief editor to manage the journal and uh, handle uh, submitted articles efficiently and swiftly, which will hopefully improve our already above average sector record. We have constituted a new international editorial advisory board, predominantly composed of scholars based in the global south. We also took this opportunity to rebalance the gender composition women and Global South colleagues now form the overwhelming majority of the board. We have invited and mandated our new board members to play an active role in disseminating the journal widely in their parts of the world and in recruiting and encouraging a diverse range of scholars to contribute to the journal, including and especially early career researchers to whom we like to offer special support and continue to do so. So now it is my enormous pleasure to introduce uh, Raka Ray, who is professor in the departments of sociology and uh, so South and Southeast Asian studies at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Raka was the chair of sociology of the sociology department and recently took over as Dean of Social Sciences amidst the pandemic. We are therefore exceptionally grateful that she agreed to give this lecture despite all the additional work and responsibilities that being a Dean in this dire times must entail. Raka has worked on a wide range of subjects and has a large number of publications, two pioneering monographs and four edited volumes, as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters. Many of these have set the agenda and terms of intellectual debate in critical areas of analytical inquiry, notably on gender. Gender has been an abiding theme in Raka's work. Her first book, Fields of Protest, examined women's movements in two Indian cities. Her book, Cultures of Servitude, co-authored with Simin Kayum, is a path-breaking study of domestic workers in which she showed how class and gendered inequality is produced and reproduced in the private world of the household. An extension of this uh, work um, uh, on gender is a work on feminist and gendered pedagogy. The book Social Life of Gender, which is co-written with former students, is a new global approach to teaching the sociology of gender in the US. The Handbook of Gender in India is a horizon scanning exercise covering fields ranging from the law to politics and from sexuality to religion. She was also the editor of Feminist Studies for long 10 years, from 1994 to 2004. Raka's work also engages with key themes in India's democratic politics. The book Social Movements in India explored social movements across several epochs in post-colonial India. This was co-edited with Mary Kadzenstein. Another co-edited book, this time with Amita Babiskar, Elite and Everyman, made a seminal contribution to the study of democracy in India showing how the cultural politics and dominance of middle classes undermine democracy. Raka has a broader interest in shaping the discipline of sociology from a gendered perspective, as I mentioned earlier, but also from a post-colonial perspective. In a range of essays and uh, journal special issues, 
Raka has commented on the epistemology and theoretical possibilities of post-colonial sociology and on how the absence of post-colonial reflexivity limits sociological analysis. Raka's current project addresses major issues in India's current rapid economic transformation, encompassing class, gender, and youth. I will say no more on this since the paper today is drawn from this research. So I will hand over to Raka after I introduce Cheryl, but once again, Raka, huge thanks for making time to give this lecture amidst your current heavy responsibilities. Um, so I would now like to introduce Cheryl Doss, who is the editor of ODS. Cheryl is, of course, my colleague here at uh, the Oxford Department of International Development. It is indeed fitting that she will chair this session, not just as the editor, editor of uh, uh, ODS, but as a stalwart of feminist scholarship, albeit from the disciplinary perspective of economics, not sociology. Her own corpus of work on gender is extensive, and she was also the president of the International Association of Feminist e uh, Economics. I'm sure Raka and Cheryl will have a very lively conversation after the lecture. So over to both of you uh, uh, with uh, you first, Raka. And Sh uh, Cheryl, I uh, expect you will explain the Q&A uh, once uh, Raka finishes, her, uh, finishes speaking. Yeah. Yes, let me, let me just say that um, participants are welcome to put questions in the Q&A throughout the talk and I will collect them and I will ask them to Raka at the end of it. So you can continue to, through the discussion to ask questions, but feel free as we go along to begin to post your questions in the Q&A channel. Over to me then. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Nandini. And thank you, Nandini and Cheryl, for this um, invitation. Um, I'm sorry I cannot see everybody um, who has tuned in, but I'm grateful that you've made the time to do so. Um, and Nandini, it's been a particular pleasure both to uh, do this new project um, uh, in sort of in conversation with the wonderful work you have done. And it's also a particular pleasure to have this opportunity to think about my own work in the midst of doing, trying to figure out how students can uh, get on Zoom and all of the um, various problems that this uh, pandemic has wrought. So let me start. A few years ago, intrigued by hyped up discourses of a new aspirational India in which new middle classes flourished in the wake of liberalization, I embarked on a pilot project intended to explore the lives and expectations of young men and women from rural and small town India who migrate to larger towns and cities in search of new work opportunities. In short, I wanted to sort of talk to the very subjects of this discourse on aspiration. What I found persuaded me to step back and reevaluate the overall focus of my project. For what I found were eager young women for whom the global incitement to neoliberal transformation was apparently working. I found young aspirational women who have been called into being, who look at the world around them and believe that things are getting better for them. So a caveat, I'm talking about women who have already left home. I'm talking about women who have left their, their small town or village homes and are you know, either in institutes um, where they're hoping to get more training or looking for work. These women believed that gender norms are loosening for them, that their lives will be better than that of their mothers. Their narratives, spoke of strategy, hope, and ambition. The men, on the other hand, many of whom wept as they spoke to me, were abject, acutely aware that they were ill-prepared for today's economy. Peripheral participants in the discourses on aspiration, terrified of failure. This talk then is inspired by those encounters. It is an attempt to draw attention to subaltern men, to the costs they are paying in a new global economy, and to the price society may well pay for misrecognizing those costs. I want to be very clear from the outset um, that this is not a talk that suggests that women are actually doing better than men, nor am I suggesting 
that we focus now on men at the expense of women. Gender equality is very, very far away. I am well aware, after all, that these younger, eager young men, I'm sorry, I'm well, that these eager young women I spoke with may well not, in fact, have better lives than their mothers. They just hope and expect that they will. So what I want us to consider here today is both how a confluence of economic, political, and cultural factors have produced this moment, as well as its consequences. Feminist research has long taught us that neither men nor women share the same experiences by virtue of their gender. And their experiences of gender itself are shaped by class, religion, caste, what have you. Yet our policies and institutions of social change have been slow to pick up on those nuances, whether understood as co-constitution or intersectionality. And they operate by and large on the principle that men are as a group powerful and women are not as a group powerful. So the UN, the field of development, and most importantly, women's movements across the globe continue to, as they should, document the existence and cost of gender inequality across the, sp the spheres of work, land rights, politics, and bodily integrity. But in the process, the category of women has emerged as the ideal subjects of development. Beyond victimhood, NGOs invest in women because they are considered to be responsible and aspirational. Two key words in this sort of neoliberal um, world we inhabit. There have indeed been gains across the board, as also as Anne-Marie Getz uh, noted at last year's ODS lecture, backsliding and backlash with an increasing rejection of liberal norms. So I don't mean to say that we are not looking at men at all. Particularly recently, it is very clear that there is a heightened awareness, belated, but it's here, the heightened awareness of the need to engage men in the project of gender equality. With several recent studies surveying men's attitudes and searching for what one study calls cracks in the mirror, cracks in the armor, where ideas of gender equality can be let in. By and large, though, in these studies, men are engaged with respect to their roles as potential perpetrators of violence, violence against women and extremist violence. Now, as global studies of uh, gender inequality and global understandings of gender inequality have become mainstreamed, the empowerment of especially women in the global south have become, has become a major cause for many, from eager undergraduates to corporations such as Nike. Young women from the global south who do dare to stand up for themselves, such as Malala from Pakistan, have rapidly become iconic figures whose autobiographies are read by school children in the US. Absent in these representations is a nuanced understanding of the variation in the power of men. To be more specific, the focus on dominant forms of masculinity has left little place for subaltern men beyond a view of them as obstacles in the way of women's empowerment. Globally, these subaltern men who do not have class advantage are increasingly seen as those the new economy has left behind. The losers in this new global order who pose a threat to society at large. So for example, in the wake of the shockingly violent rape uh, in, in New Delhi in 2012, which has you know, come to be infamously known as the New Delhi rape case, Analysis really focused on the ills of Indian masculinity, simultaneously highlighting the difference between the rapists and the victim who, are see, who was seen as an aspirational young woman determined to do well for herself and to lift her family out of poverty. 
Thus, gender theorist Ratna Kapoor writes, as women enter the workplace and the public arena, their boldness and confidence seems to trigger a sense of insecurity in a society where men are used to being in charge. So these sorts of discussions, discussions of aspirational women and failing men have come to really be part of both global and India's common sense. So the, the, the question of this problem of failing or subaltern men in a world where male jobs are disappearing is not limited to India. Many people have been writing about this. Uh, Smitha Radhakrishnan and Chinzia Solari have shown that these discourses of empowered women and failed patriarchs circulate not only in India, but in the US and in the Ukraine. In urban Africa, where the informal economy has inadequately absorbed surplus laborers, leaving the majority of men underemployed and underpaid, these men are seen as social obstructions. In the US and the UK, the problem has been seen as one of a white working class masculinity, which benefited from opportunities denied, undeniably denied to women and ethnic minorities. Now facing a crisis of lost, lost jobs, they're positioned as either abject or dangerous, usually both. So Brexit and Trump were seen as one result of this resentful group, though of course that's never the entire story. Nevertheless, the story in the US and UK hinges on the disappearance of working class men's jobs in the US case, whether to automation or to China. And it's a response of a working class masculinity to the disappearance of manufacturing blue collar labor, united by what Michael Kimmel calls aggrieved entitlement. So this paper then joins a burgeoning conversation about what men do when they are faced with structural irrelevance, with a focus on India. So I'm going to proceed in four parts. First, I'm going to turn to the specific nature of joblessness in India. Next, I'll turn to the creation of what has become an idea with exceptional staying power, the relationship of masculinity to breadwinning. I'll then turn to two very different models of collective behavior, collective action, in which these men engage as well as to the range of individual responses to their joblessness. And I'll end by pointing to the possibility of different political outcomes and indeed possibilities of ethical existence in these uncertain times. So let me start with uh, a brief foray into uh, the nature of male joblessness in India. Two peculiarities mark the case of India. The first is its very low women's labor force participation at under 25% and declining. The second is that while in many parts of the world, the story of the disappearance of male jobs is about the disappearance of manufacturing, the story is a little different in India where perhaps uniquely there never were enough manufacturing jobs to begin with. Rather, as farm workers exit agriculture in the absence of an expansion in, in, of industry, young men are leapfrogged into the service sector, bypassing manufacturing altogether. This is really very, very rare. So if you think about the larger history of, um, of, of changes in the economy. So these men fall back on informal, low-skilled jobs within the service sector. The men whom I met and about whom I speak today never made it to the traditional working class, the landing platform of rural peasantry in the urban world. The specificity of the transformation of India's economy with its leapfrogging from agriculture directly into service has yielded uh, a sector that has admittedly contributed to both India's GDP and employment, but where job growth has not kept pace with demand. 
So after the initial euphoria of rising GDP in the 1990s, analysts now worry about the specter of jobless growth. For the last 30 years, manufacturing as a percentage of GDP has been almost stagnant. Despite Prime Minister Modi's Make in India campaign, which, which never actually got off the ground, the manufacturing sector is shedding jobs. So if we just look at the relationship of the of labor force participation and GDP statistics, in India, agriculture is now responsible for 42% of labor force participation, but only 16% of GDP. Industry is responsible for 26% um, of labor force participation and 25% of GDP. And services are responsible for 32% of labor force participation and 50% of GDP. So urban men between the ages of 20 and 24 account for 13.5% of the working age population in India, but 60% of the unemployed. In essence, India needs to create 8 million jobs a year to absorb the net new entrance in the working age population. And this is far, far from a possibility. So, you know, in the, in the media, you'll come across stories, many, many stories like this. In 2015, the government of the largest state of India, Uttar Pradesh, advertised 368 job openings for low level government employees, low level clerical workers. They received 2.3 million applications, including applications from 250 PhD candidates, 25,000 people with graduate degrees, and 152,000 people with undergraduate degrees, right, for 360 low-level government employ employment. So in order to counteract the issue of jobless growth, the Indian government has focused on trying to correct what it calls a skill mismatch in the hope that skill development will lead to the hiring of youth by industry. So the National Skill Development Corporation was created with the goal of skilling 150 million Indians by 2022 by, and I quote, catalyzing the creation of large quality for-profit vocational institutions. Thousands of training centers have sprung up in the smaller cities and towns of India with the mandate to train young people to fill the skill gap, to provide at a cost training programs to youth. And Nandini Guptu has written so thoughtfully about these programs. So who are these young women who are, uh, sorry, who are these young men who are attempting to participate in the new economy? Very often, they are men from farming families whose mothers don't work. The men largely come from a combination of sort of a combination of castes from upper to uh, other backward castes and some lower castes. They may attend the thousands of vocational schools that now dot the cityscapes of small towns, perhaps learning hardware and networking skills. In order to be made employable, they may invest in both technical classes and English and personality development classes. Because they know that their dream companies are not going to hire people who do not speak English. They may ideally want a secure office job, but more often than not, they are going to become informal service sector workers, such as security guards, office boys, restaurant workers, van drivers, and janitors or after a few years of struggle, they will return to the village in shame when they cannot find or keep their jobs. Superficially imparted skills cannot bridge the divide between the young man who went to a rural school and college in a vernacular language and the one who received his degree from an English medium school in the city. The chasm between a rural habitus and a neoliberal marketized world of 
what Nandini Gupta has described as self-governing and self-responsibilization is not easily bridgeable. So what happens to these men in the absence of work? The failure to understand the economy as always already marked by the analytical category of gender, race, caste, etc., where relevant, has led in the wake of global changes in men's work to an inadequate understanding of the complexity of the resentments wrought by these changes. So I want to enter this discussion by way of a consideration of the idea of masculinity itself. So I'm calling this section, the creation of man, the provider. So there's a vast literature now on the definition, classification and theorization of masculinity or masculinities. I will engage it here only to say I am indebted to it and that I understand masculinity to be a project accompanied by a set of beliefs, norms, practices, emotions, privileges, and powers, most importantly powers, associated with being understood to be male. Ideals of masculinity are structurally created and culturally imposed, individually experienced and negotiated and sought to be achieved. So it's a project and it is constantly something that needs to be achieved. But as with all gendered ideas and practices, there are histories to it. So in the context of post-colonial India, this means that pre-colonial understandings of masculinity are partially overlaid and partially replaced by colonial notions of masculinity instituted in law and practice, as well as nationalist and post-colonial reconstructions. So I find it most useful to think, think in these terms that, that, that we, we might usefully think of a sort of historically situated and layered repertoire of masculinity that can be drawn upon, right? That is historically situated, layered, and it's a repertoire. So we accept now that work is central to male gender identity. But that it is so has a history. Studies of political economy and gender have made clear that the nature of masculinity was fundamentally altered with the onset of capitalism and wage labor. As James Ferguson reminds us, both European social democracies and their colonies were built on the universal figure of a worker who was embodied male. So I want to assert here the exceptional power of this idea today, not just for the economy and for women's disadvantage in the labor force, but in the constitutive formation of men, even for men whose main formation is not within manufacturing capitalism. But I also want to say, that the idea of a family with male breadwinning wage earners where women should not have to work, um, work outside the home was also, as I said, a creation, right? So it slowly comes into being in the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe and subsequently with the spread of both capitalism and colonialism takes ideological root across much of the world. So in the US and Europe, this came to be institutionalized as the family wage. And in India, though this idea became ubiquitous somewhat later, it has proved to, be, to have particular staying power. Just to be clear, uh, most of you know this, but I, just, to, just to be clear, the family wage is essentially the principle of one person um, in a family earning enough to cover the needs of the family. So this, 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 this family wage idea, which is essentially the breadwinner idea, not only has a staying power, but it has a history because it wasn't 
just a natural consequence of capitalism. It was also consciously created and nurtured. Taking the case of India, starting with the 1871 Indian census, regardless of the number of women workers already uh, in existence, women and children were sought to be seen as consumers in the family and not producers. And any confusion between the two was sternly forbidden. In fact, the, the, the census is kept repeating again and again, the idea that women were not producers, women were not workers, women were uh, consumers in the family, that, that the head of the family was a man and as such was responsible um, you know, for his dependents, which included his wife and children. So much so that Radha Kumar, uh, historian Radha Kumar actually calls what these censuses did as a declaration of intent. Eventually, by the 1930s, the number of workers, women workers, especially in mills, began to decline. After independence, women's issues were seen increasingly as welfare issues, not issues of labor. Women's issues were to be dealt with under the auspices of the Ministry of Welfare. And women workers, in historian Shomita Shen's word, words, were increasingly seen as mothers who had to work. But that's actually not the whole story about Indian masculinity. The work done on colonial India suggests several elements that need to be brought together to understand masculinity in contemporary India. While Ashish Nandi has suggested that it was through the colonial process that the rigid gender binaries that marked uh, the post-Enlightenment West entered India. In Tanika Sarkar's words, having allowed himself to be colonized, the Hindu male had to make himself anew. And he did so through the construction of a Hindu domesticity in which the chaste body of the Hindu woman who stayed within the home would come to represent the Hindu difference from the West while men then came to represent the outer world. Men were to represent the outer world, men were to represent the outer world at work, in the public spheres, in all spheres outside of the home. Notions of honor and shame, as well as a new sense of militant manhood were heightened in both colonial struggles and in the communal struggles between Hindus and Muslims that ensued in the process of these uh, nationalist struggles. Thus was created a repertoire of sometime contradictory social arrangements with the overlaying of Victorian gender ideology on upper caste Hindu notions of women's seclusion and nationalist struggles against colonialism such that gender differences were reified and gender norms about male protection and male breadwinning solidified and tied to the fate of the nation. All this together yielded what Kumkum Sangari has called an astonishing consensus around gender and labor, the public and the domestic sphere. This astonishing consensus has led India to have an astonishingly low level of women's labor force participation. Just to refer to an earlier study uh, that uh, I did on domestic workers, um, I found that women domestic workers considered themselves particularly ill-fated, not so much because their working conditions were poor, which they were, but because their menfolk were incapable of sustaining them or their children. What they lamented was not really the poor working conditions. What they lamented was that despite being women, they had to work outside the home. They were ill-fated because their men were incapable. The Bengali word they used was okkum. In many parts of the world, from China to Nigeria to India, the inability to earn a living wage implies the inability to create a family. Unemployed men struggle 
to find wives. In Haryana, a state in India, they are considered to be immature. In the Ivory Coast, they're considered to be youth. In post-socialist China, these unmarried men are called 50% men. So if to be a breadwinner was a man's duty, it was also his way to perform himself, to perform intimacy, to show what Mark Hunter has called in the case of KwaZulu-Natal, provider love. Exclusion from the productive sphere then may lead to exclusion from the reproductive sphere, leaving men with a double sense of failure. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so let me now turn to the third part of my talk, politics. What kind of politics then does such a moment produce? To what kinds of politics does this feeling of structural irrelevance draw these young men? I have said that these men are seen individually as professional loiterers, potential predators. One common understanding as we survey the globe is that this is also a moment of the rise of right-wing populism and that this populism is fueled by angry men who feel disenfranchised. But is right-wing populism the only possibility for politics in the context of these men's lives? Let me turn to two movements in which, in which unemployed young men in India participate. I'm going to label them, forgive me, perhaps simplistically, as regressive and progressive. The regressive represents the sort of nationalist violence, violent movement that many, in fact, expect of this population, right-wing populism. The second is the large-scale farmer protest going on at this very moment in which these young men are also active participants. But first, the right-wing movement. Let's call it protecting cows and women. Thomas Blum Henson wrote years ago about the nativist political party the Shiv Sena, and the ways in which it drew young women into it. These men received power and status and mentorship. The Shiv Sena is but one of the many nationalist and nativist organizations in which masculinity in the sense of male domination is intrinsic to the project. Right? So that male domination is intrinsic to this nationalist project. Today, Violent elements of Hindu nationalism are embodied by young groups of vigilantes riding motorcycles, perhaps, to police the various elements of what they see as the Hindu social world. Members of the Cow Protection Society may lynch Muslims who are presumed to have beef in their homes. <clears throat> and proudly proclaim as well that they have shut down the shops of hundreds of Muslim butchers. And because they, they, they serve beef or they, they, they sell beef. And members of other groups may look for signs of a Hindu woman romantically involved with a Muslim man, break up their date, beat up the man and haul him to a police station. How can they do this? Remember the state of Uttar Pradesh where there were all of these uh, people who were applying for low level jobs? Well, the new chief minister in that state, Yogi Adityanath is an extremist, nakedly majoritarian politician who has passed what's called a prohibition of unlawful religious conver conversion ordinance, right? the prohibition of unlawful religious conver conversion ordinance. He passed this late last year. And this requires that if there is religious conversion after marriage, and he's really talking about the conversion of Hindu women to Islam after marrying a Muslim man. If there is religious conversion after marriage, it has to be approved by a district magistrate. 
While technically this ordinance does not bar interfaith marriages, in effect, mere hours of the after the passage of this ordinance, young men were breaking up marriage parties, confronting Hindu women who were seen with Muslim men and having these Muslim men arrested on the grounds of possible abduction and forced conversions. This is one result of what has been called the Love Jihad campaign. Love Jihad. This campaign started over a decade ago and has now taken root in key states run by unapologetically Hindu nationalist leaders. And it's based on the false premise that Muslim women seduce Hindu women into falling in love with them and marrying them as part of a conspiracy to demographically destroy Hindus. In fact, interfaith marriages are very rare in India. But this movement is deliberately and highly organized by various right-wing groups, chiefly the RSS, and it has a deep cultural resonance in that it taps into the historical memory of similar anxieties and similar moves in starting with the 1920s when groups such as the Arya Samaj tried to draw harder lines between the Muslim and Hindu communities using men, men's policing of women's bodies to do so. Pamphlets circulated then, as they do now, threatening the catastrophic decline of the Hindu population. Then, as now, Hindu men leapt into their roles as protectors. Now, they leap into their roles as protectors rather than providers. In an evocative praise used by um, uh, Gokariksel, Newbert, and Smith, issues such as love jihad are demographic fever dreams. Like feverish dreams, these la narratives lack coherence, even as they evoke deeply felt emotions, fears that justify defensive violent masculinity to perceived threats of immigrants and outsiders. Thus, Yogi Adityanath can threaten, and I quote, if one Hindu girl is converted, we will convert a hundred Muslim girls. The way Hindu girls are insulted, I don't think a civilized society would accept it. If the government is not doing anything, he wasn't in the government then. If the government was not do, is not doing anything, then the Hindus will have to take matters into their own hands. What we have here is a conscious and successful politicization with historical roots that draws upon the trope of men as protectors, protectors of their sisters and all Hindu women against a sexual predator, the Muslim man. This form of collective action then feeds into men's feelings of displacement and failure and gives them an identity. The leaders are not all young men, but they form the bulk of the participants. The celebrations when such events are stopped are frenzied, a manic manifestation of the politics of displaced resentment, where the oppressor, the threat, is not the economy or the state, but men of a minority community. The Hindu right has been able to capitalize on and promote available Hindu, narrative, Hindu cultural narratives with deep roots. Narratives that cycle, simultaneously harken back to the male protector and the glory of a Hindu Rashtra to create a powerful politics. <clears throat> These men see themselves as waging a moral campaign where they can at last show their worth as men. And indeed, I should also add that though the numbers of these interfaith marriages are infinite, infinitesimal, far too tiny to have any impact, there is still a sense that they are reducing by, the, by their actions, they are reducing competition in the marriage market in which these men's failure as breadwinners already has them as a dis, at a disadvantage. 
simultaneously predators and protectors. This is prerogative power writ large. <clears throat> okay. But this is not the only collective movement today. Though it is powerful and deep and continually replenishes its forces from the deep well of underemployed and anxious men, but this is not the only collective movement. The second movement to which I now turn is one that has captured the attention of the world. And not just because of Rihanna and uh, Greta Thunberg's tweets, the farmer's protests of North India. So the farmer and his land. Even as we speak, more than a half million farmers are camped out on the outskirts of Delhi in what is by and large a peaceful protest. They have been joined at various points by workers, students, teachers, housewives. On November 26th, there was a general strike of 250 million people in their support, making it perhaps the single largest general strike in history. This is led by the farmers from Punjab and Haryana, the most important farming belt in India. They are protesting the passage of three bills that threaten to drastically alter the relationship of smallholder farmers with the structured state mediated market to in effect take away the hard fought state protections for agriculture and open it up entirely and without mediation to corporate interests. I have to say, um, lest anybody sort of think that this is about uh, farmers resisting the market. No, agriculture in Punjab and Haryana has, has been marketized or been in the market uh, for over a hundred years. This is about taking away the protections and, un, and, and, and sort of an unmediated market. Um, which will open them up completely, each individual smallholder farmer to corporate interests. So this is a massive movement. And while most of the participants are farmers, including farming women, there are also thousands of young unemployed or young edu and educated men, like the man that um, interviewed by the Voice of America, um, who they say, defies the typical image of the Indian farmer. So he's this, this man and, and many like him, the 27 year old uh, postgraduate in information technology who returned to farming after struggling for five years to find a job that would pay a modest wage. So these are men very like the ones I spoke with at the vocational institutes who were trying hard to get white collar jobs and failing that this man that Voice of America spoke with and many like him, failing that they believe that their ability to farm must be protected at all costs. So they've returned to the land. Many of them are sort of eldest sons who were sent out because the land wasn't enough um, to sustain them all. So now they've returned to the land. Recall that there is little industry. This is true, especially in the Punjab. Their land is all they have. Their small family farms are their only security in a state where unemployment among young men is at 21.6%. That this movement has been sustained through the cold winter and that it keeps on gaining in popularity is due to many factors. To begin with, it is an inclusive, not an exclusionary movement. Indeed, these young men are part of something much larger. They are inheritance, they are inheritors of long traditions of peasant and farmer movements in India. The agrarian crisis has only grown in the past decades as recent agricultural policy has amounted to nothing more than the attempt to get people out of agriculture without actually providing them with an alternative. Shreya Sinha documents how this crisis has led to wider and wider solidarities 
Um, she mentions, uh, she reminds us of the long march of 2018, where indigenous and landless farmers were, walked alongside the landed, demanding political recognition. The organizing body of this particular uh, protest, the Samyukta Kisan Morcha, is an umbrella body of 41 farmer unions. In the specific case of the Punjab, there is a strong tie between the farmers and the urban dwellers, especially in the Sikh community, and the Sikhs are uh, about 60% of the Punjabi population. They all share the same roots, with most families having members in both the farmlands and the towns. Perhaps most importantly, the identity of farmer is much more than a class identity encompassing tradition, culture, family, and village. And caste for sure, while it is certainly shaded with caste, it also exceeds it. For the farmer identity has deep roots in the imagination of the nation, such that when the otherwise charismatic prime minister refer to these farmers um, as protesters, uh, as sort of as agitators and terrorists or as anti-national, his words find no purchase. These protests also tap into community traditions of Sikhism in which people are fed at the end of services at the Gurdwara, such that huge kitchens have been set up overseen by men and women alike. While farmers remain at the heart of this movement in ever widening circles, the movement has become a venue to challenge the, the state's authoritarianism, the lack of press freedom, the lack of democracy, the lack of state accountability. While on the other, really spearheaded initially by the fear of losing livelihood. Here then, we have a movement in which identity is central, but which is able to build solidaristic ties across other identities. But most men do not in fact join social movements. They struggle on by themselves, trying to make do. But what is the well from which these two movements I have described can draw their adherence? Let me try and connect in this last section, a range of individual responses which provide, collect which provide openings for collective action. So understanding, as, as Borgia does, that agents have unequal mastery over the instruments of symbolic representation, and thus their ability to represent the social world in a way that best corresponds with their interests uh, varies. I turn now to what I see as three categories of individual responses that men have when faced with structural irrelevance. The first category of responses to the inability to get jobs or to the loss of jobs can be broadly thought of as, let's call it compensatory domination. This could be, and, and I'm gonna give you two examples. This could be a reassertion of domination. For example, when in the desire to maintain power, they assert, men assert their uh, prerogative power against women or they scapegoat others responsible as responsible for taking away their jobs or taking away their women by turning to violence, right? They come down hard on the women in their lives. They blame others for their situation, a blame which is often misrecognition. In other words, in this reaction to their perception that their masculinity is at threat if they cannot be a breadwinner, men may heighten the predatory aspects of masculine power on an individual level. The second uh, compensatory possibility is that when faced with economic structural irrelevance, men try to resituate dominance. They try to dominate other spheres. When excluded from the sphere of production, then they may seek to derive their domination from um, belonging or authority elsewhere by allying with for, with, for example, those who are in power politically, becoming rally supporters, crowd organizers, and mobilizers. 
they may earn very little for this work, perhaps food and transportation costs for the day, but it gives them some authority. Uh, Jordana Matlin talks about uh, this in the case of the Ivory Coast, and Craig Jeffries highlights young Jat men in India who become uh, political fixers with political parties. In a study of Nigerian men, uh, Daniel Jordan Smith notes that Pentecostal men use the church to reassert patriarchal authority when it falters elsewhere. In these cases, men attempt to retain masculine power through attempts to control alternative institutions, the church, politics. In compensatory strategies then, there is an attempt to hold on to power men consider to be owed them by means other than by being the breadwinner. Okay, so these are the strategies of what compensatory domination. But a second set of strategies is simply not to pursue any longer the project of male domination. This is obviously much more rare, but it is visible in some pockets. And I think it's important that we note these pockets. For example, men can begin to help women with their micro enterprise work. And yes, they perhaps do divide up heavy work and light work. Um, but these are often cases where women do the managing, including the handling of money. There are also cases where men simply begin to do more domestic work at home. You know, in the case of um, women who migrate, uh, like in the Philippines or Indonesia or Vietnam, um, we often think about families as coming together to look after the children um, who are left behind the extended families. And, and that is often true, but it's also true that many men do in fact step up, not by any means the majority. So these men can reframe masculinity as tied not to domination, but to responsibility. As I found in earlier work on, uh, in my earlier work on male domestic workers, with these young male domestic workers I spoke with they just wanted to be good fathers and guide their children, though they could not provide for them well. So here we have men aware of their inability to live up to the dominant project of masculinity, trying to figure out simply how best to exist in their fam with their families and in the world, not seeking to dominate. The most numerous in this number are the two groups I would call the hangers out and the hangers on. Craig Jeffries refers to what uh, educated unemployed Jat men in India do in the terms they use themselves, time pass. They congregate in public spaces, street corners, and pass the time, chatting, uh, chatting, making observations about passers-by, often women, who experience these congregations as threats and as a sign that street corners are not safe for them. I just looked at the time and I realized I'm probably over time. Should I wrap up as quickly as possible? I, I'm getting to the end, but yeah, let me, uh, I, I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so these men, you know, they, they do what, what is called time pass. They, they hang out, they um, yeah, on street corners. So they fine tune the art of killing time with artful conversation uh, or what's called adda. Michael Ralph describes these men in Senegal, in urban Senegal, as creating these impromptu tea shacks in which they make tea, not for sale, but for their friends. They kill time making, making and drinking tea in a ritualized manner. They kill time because that is all they have. And in doing so, they elevate the time they spend making tea into an aesthetic. Here in the company of other men, they hang out, spin fantasies of global travel and a better life, swap stories of migrants who made it big. They hang out. In the vocational institutes of India, most of the young men I encounters didn't hang out. They are the hangers on. Excessively obedient, they learned all the rules, even those they don't understand. They learned, they tried to learn to work by city as opposed to village time, struggle to follow what they are being taught, wish they had paid more attention in school. They wept when discussing their anxiety and their fears of letting their people, their families who they believe depend on them down. They are the sons of farmers being leapfrogged into a client-oriented 
service sector, bypassing the absent manufacturing sector, and their agrarian habitus prepares them ill for the social expectations of the service sector economy. These men have really no sense of empowerment in their lives. They see themselves as having to endure. Endure just long enough to make it. They hang on. Reactionary social movements like the cow protection and love jihad both draw from and feed into those men in the first category, men who use compensatory mechanisms to reclaim their domination at home. Progressive movements such as the farmers movement can draw from men who are trying to build a different life, not necessarily one marked by a masculine project, giving them a purpose larger than themselves. But the vast majority of men, those who hang out and those who hang on, are really what I would call the equivalent of the swing vote. They can either be drawn into movements of male domination in which, uh, in which men of other groups are the enemy, or they could be drawn into larger movements of solidarity in which men participate even as men, but in which the project is not premised on male domination. While the second is a more difficult project than the first, to be sure, the farmers movement shows that there are, I'm just speaking about India right now, the farmers movement in India shows that there are other deep culturally embedded identities that can be available outside of militant Hindu masculinity that can be drawn from to create a narrative of belonging for these men. So let me conclude. I've tried to suggest here that the repertoire of masculinity that exists came about due to, a com due to a combination of economic, political, and cultural circumstances. The actions of people, including colonial and post-colonial state actors, created the ideal of the breadwinner where it did not already exist. And therefore, because employment in a market economy was constitutively gendered, so too are the consequences of its decline, whether it be due to the loss of jobs or in the case of India, the failure to create enough jobs. And indeed, the consequences of this failure resonate widely in society, on the men themselves and on women. As we pay attention to the anxieties of these abject young men in these unsettled times, however, we should not assume that they will inevitably attempt to, to reconstitute masculinity as a domination. Even as we explore the variety of ways in which men are trying to make sense of their lives in the absence of jobs, we must also begin to exercise our imaginations about the social and political possibilities of projects of solidarity that exceed or replace projects of masculinity. Thank you, I'll end here. Great, thank you very much, wow. <laughs> so again, I'm gonna open it up for questions, encourage people to write their questions in the Q&A box, um, and then I will kind of sort them out a bit and, and feed them back to Rebecca. Um, but there's not a way to do on this, in the format we're in at the moment, there's not a way for you to raise your hand and speak. So if you've got questions, please put them in the, in the Q&A. Um, so one question is, what are the left movements trying to do to help these men? Sorry? What are the left movements trying to do to help these men? I actually don't think they are trying to do anything specifically to help these men. I think what, um, I think what I'm trying to say is they should consciously <laughs> understand that this is a well in from which they can draw and not concede the territory, um, you know, to to the, the 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 sort of right wing or nationalist groups. Now, political parties, uh, whether left or right, the mass based, uh, Carter based political parties, have historically drawn from. Uh, Un unemployed men. 
So, uh, the, so the left political parties right now are, are, are in, in, in shambles. So they're not doing very much. Um, but I think that the, the ways in which the sort of progressive movements or left movements have, um, have embraced the farmer movements, um, it is possible that they will, uh, I, I hope that they will actually see that, that this is a way to, to bring them in. But I think this has to be consciously done. You know, I think this has to be uh, identities, the creation of identities, I think is, uh, identities, they have to be a sort of conscious project. They have to be able to be built and linked to historical roots uh, to make it most viable. So I think that th the reason I end this way, and I, and I thank the, the, the person who wrote the first question, the thing I, the, I ended this talk this way because it is in fact my way of, of saying to the, the, the left wing and the progressives, you, you, have, you, you have all of this, tap into it. So that person has added just a quick follow-up question about haven't the left been gender blind and are they changing? So the left, yes, the left has been gender blind. <laughs> yes, of course, the left has been gender blind. But, you know, I want to say that um, I'm just going to speak about India for, for a minute. Starting in the 1970s, women's movements were allied very, very closely to the left in India, creating women's wings of political parties, creating autonomous women of leftist, you know, leftist women, but who organized autonomously so that they could influence uh, the political parties. Um, so, that, so, you know, women on the left have been very, very active. Um, and they have been um, very active with working women, with trade union women. Um, they've been very active uh, pushing legislation. So I don't actually want to say that um, the left has done the, the left has been entirely gender blind. What the left, so the left hasn't done enough by, you know, at all by far, but if they are, to the extent that they are not gender blind, they are aware of classical women's issues. They are not aware of masculinity. They are not aware of uh, the, 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 unspoken, unthought, easy assumptions of male domination in, in you know, on the streets, on the, on, on, in, in, you know, in terms of who speaks at political rallies or political parties, you know, those sorts of things, the, the, the unspoken assumptions of, of male domination are, are, is something that the left is still blind to. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about the structurally irrelevant men and their relationships with more established middle-class men and women. Do these men look up to middle-class men and women or deride them or perhaps something else? And before you answer that, I just wanna say again to everybody that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat because I'm not monitoring the chat. I'm just monitoring the Q&A, so. The question is, do these structurally irrelevant men look up to middle class men or do they derive them? Right. Or deride them? Um, I would say they look up to them. I would say that um, If, if you were to ask me, what do all of these structurally irrelevant men want? They want a government job. <laughs> That's what they want. They want a safe, secure government job. So they may deride them. They may heckle them. They may think of them as um, 
as, uh, you know, dressed up babus, but they all want what they have. They want that safe, secure government job. So, um, so the, the, there could be derision, but, but, but mostly it is uh, a desire to have what they have. Great. Um, then we've got two questions kind of related. What should be the role of reproduction in the private sphere in redefining masculinity? And then related to that, what was the role of feminist movements, if any, in helping to redefine masculinity and the role of young men? Uh, what was the first one? Um, what should be the role of reproduction in the private sphere in redefining masculinity? So that's a very, very big question. <laughs> uh, I mean, <laughs> um, because this is not just about, you know, what I spoke of really was the connection between men's um, ability to be successful in the productive sphere and their ability to be successful in the reproductive sphere, um, which is linked. But that's obviously only part of the story um, to, to redefine masculinity, because that's not going to redefine masculinity. That's just going to uh, be, allow men to carry on, um, you know, doing what they have always done. That's, you know, that, that, that link that I spoke about is only going to, make men feel, okay, if I'm successful in the productive sphere now, I can also be a successful man. I can marry, I can have a family, I can, I can, um, I, I can be a man. So that's not going to, uh, you know, rethink masculinity. Rethinking masculinity in the private sphere is, 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 a, is a very different thing. Um, that is, that requires far more, um, from other sorts of uh, women's movements, from uh, from empowered women at home who can uh, who can uh, you know negotiate privately at home, um, it requires um, uh, I think the sort of change um, that will come as part of a larger project that men can engage that is not a project of masculine domination. I think what I'm trying to actually uh, say here is that a lot of the, it, perhaps it's, it's, it's sort of, it's a parallel argument, but I think it's linked. Much of the literature on, um, on engaging men are engaging men in the project of gender equality. And I'm not entirely sure that that's the way to get gender equality. What I'm suggesting is that by, in, by, by lessening the importance of the project of masculinity and getting men involved in projects outside of their masculinity may be a better way to get at um, gender equality. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I, 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 have, I know that there's a, there are many, 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 many worthy projects about gender equality, in, gender equality in which men are being engaged as men, being taught how to stop being violent, et cetera. In, in my reading, I do not think that is the best path to, this, uh, to, to, um, to social change where uh, gender equality is, is concerned. In my reading, it is the possibility of um, understanding your identity and interests and solidarity with other people who are not men uh, necessarily or, who, or, or other identities that are not about masculinity that will get us there. So, so this is a, you know, the question here is a very, very large question. Um, how have feminist movements redefined masculinity? I think they're trying in many, many ways. Um, um, 
you know, through some of these uh, organizations that I just uh, uh, just spoke about, they're trying at individual levels and they're trying at um, at um, at group levels. Um, and indeed, though, uh, I mean, I want to say that I, that, that this is going to sound very very materialist, but I guess that is. I'm outing myself as a materialist here, <laughs> that in some sense, many of the men who have stepped in to take up the slack in housework have not done it because they think, oh, you know, I should do 50% of the housework. That leads to a fair and equitable um, household. They've done it because their wives were too busy or the wives were working. You know, they often stepped in because materially they had to. Right. And then once they do so, that opens up the opportunity um, to, you know, for a redefinition, you know, of, of the relationship within the home. So, in fact, um, I, I think that, you know, there has to be, you know, material change and political change and cultural change and all of that. But within the sphere of the home, it is very, very often um, a combination, I think, of two things. First, the fact that the, the, the woman is, um, is working and simply doesn't have the time. And so the men have to pick up the slack. But it's also it comes, I would say, from men's participation in these larger movements, when they actually get exposed to larger ideas of, of camaraderie and solidarity. Great. Um, then we've got a question that says, please tell us more about the mediat mediatized nature of masculinity. Much of it celebrates and stokes violence, um, the circulation of selfie videos of men assaulting others. Are there alternative media discourses that support progressive masculine strategies? I don't know the answer to that question. I think <laughs> that uh, she, I'm being asked a really big question. <laughs> and I, I just feel like I'm not really, um, I, I don't really know enough about the use of, uh, of, of social media. You know, there are people who, uh, I mean, what I do know is, um, is, shocking that shocking things horrifying things uh, far more quickly attract attention than um benign things so it's much easier for um for acts of violence to be mediatized than acts of benevolence um but i would say i would say that The, the, the question of media, which I'm going to actually interpret as a question of social media, is one of the things that scholars of social movements are most grappling with right now. You know, the, 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 the response to social media, the, the, the reaction to social media, the ways in which, um, you know, things can, can, can spark uh, movements on social media are still things that are being grappled with. Um, and I'm not an expert in that, I, so I, should, I shouldn't even go there. Great. We've got a couple questions kind of taking it, thinking about it for other contexts. So one is that the farmers movement seems premised on the fact that farmers have retained rights over their land. What about situations where both access to land and jobs are both elusive, such as in South Africa? Um, question goes on to say, if political economy and masculinity are intertwined and progressive movements need to tackle both, what should we conclude in such cases? Okay, let me answer both of them together, actually. Um, so we are living in a world where there simply aren't going to be enough jobs for everybody. So I do think that even though the example I gave of the farmers movement is very much a, a movement about uh, land, jobs, and um, 
and access to land and jobs. We actually also have to begin to think about building a progressive politics that is not so based, so much based um, on labor. And, and, and what, what James Ferguson has called the, the sort of productionist bias of, um, of, our, of our movements. Um, most of our progressive movements about uh, distribution and redistribution have to do with, um, with, 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 with uh, jobs, with jobs, with earning, with, with land, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, precisely because of the connection of men and breadwinning, of men to breadwinning, the, 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 our traditional left movements, um, which focus on breadwinning, are therefore also um, uh, tend to favor men and, and, and men's involvement. If we are entering a time when there simply won't be enough jobs for people, we have to think about what should the basis be for, a, for an alternative progressive slash leftist politics? And as James, and I'm going to follow James Ferguson here in his uh, wonderful book, Give a Man a Fish, um, where he suggests that we need to focus our progressive politics and our politics of solidarity, not on production, but on redistribution. That we need to really, you know, make claims you know, on the state, whether it's, you know, you can think about universal basic income or, you know, all of these sorts of things. We need to now shift our focus really on redistribution. And in, in that way, um, you know, when you, your, your politics is no longer, it's a progressive politics, it's a politics about equality, it's a politics about fairness and need, but it is not a politics that is based on access to jobs and access to land in a world where a lot of people simply aren't going to have jobs. I feel like I've got lots of questions, but I'm gonna keep sticking with <laughs> some of the ones that the audience is, is asking. Um, so we've got somebody who's commenting that much of their research is focused on the US precisely in the rural deindustrialized areas that have succumbed to Trump's right-wing nationalism. He says, I'm wondering how the intersection of masculinity with race, um, such as whiteness, interact to produce a certain type of masculinity that may be more vulnerable to radicalization. So um, in the US, the family wage was tied not just to men, it was tied to white men. The family wage uh, sort of offered uh, white men, such as men who worked um, in the, on the Fordist assembly line. It offered white men a secure job such that their women would not have to work. Left out of this Fordist compact were immigrant men, black men, women of all kinds, right? So in the US, the decline of the family wage has simultaneously meant, it, it has simultaneously attacked the gender, class and racial identity of white working class men. It's sort of a threefer. And so what they're, so together with the decline of the family wage and the disappearance of jobs, together with the rise of social movements, such as the women's movement and the movements for racial justice, right? The, these men feel attacked on all fronts, losing ground on all fronts. And this is why they have been particularly vulnerable um, to radicalization by the right. The left in the US, so 
in general, I would say the right has been much smarter about understanding that identity, about bringing together class identity with other identities, right? Um, by, you know, taking the working class identity and, and, and really working with uh, the nativist, uh, sort of a nativist uh, and, and, and white supremacist and, and male supremacist angles. They've been far better than the left. The left has, you know, unfortunately, and now I'm actually just gonna speak about the US um, because I do not want to generalize. The left in the US has really split, has been really split between uh, uh, economic left and what's called the sort of social left, the, the, the rights, uh, the identity left. Um, what Nancy Fraser sort of calls, you know, you have movements for redistribution and you have movements for recognition. And so the movements for redistribution and recognition have been really split in the US and they, they need to come together to do a more effective job. And that really gets us back to the first question that I was asked about, um, you know, what is the left doing? In some sense, the, I think progressive movements all over the world have to do perhaps a better job of, of, of understanding that we, that, that, so, that human beings socially, are, are socially constituted, not just with one identity, but we actually encompass multiple. And that the ones that can, can actually bring different, all of these elements together are going to actually be stronger. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think we are out of time. We've got a few more questions there, but um, I think you've touched on many of the issues, not even if you haven't specifically answered those questions, you've touched on many of the issues that people were asking. And there's been also a lot of people saying thank you and really noting that this was a really both an incredible and a hopeful analysis. Um, so thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us this, this thank morning. Thank you so you, very much. I us. very much appreciate it. I appreciate the questions. And I hope that at some point you can send me some of these other questions so that I can take a look at this, you know, and, and see um, it's because it's very thought provoking for me as well to see these wonderful questions. Great. Very good. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.